All right. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to Eaglebrook Church. It's really good to have you with us today. If you're at one of our seven campuses meeting throughout the Twin Cities or if you're participating in church online, always an honor to have each of you with us every week. We are beginning a brand new series today. It's called Holy Wow. And we're asking the question, what is it that makes you go wow? In, in the world we live in today with information overload and all the technology that's at our fingertips, is there anything anymore that makes you go wow? A few years ago, one of my sons came home from school and he said, Dad, I'm reading this book. And in the book, there's these two characters and they go to this restaurant. It's kind of like a steakhouse, but he said it's crazy because at this restaurant, they give you two cards, a green card and a red card. And he said, as long as you put the green card out on your table, the waiters will come and they'll give you meat, like steak and shaved beef and things like that. He said, they'll keep doing that until you put the red card out, indicating that you're done. He said, isn't that unbelievable? He said, can you imagine if a place like that actually existed? I said, well, it, it does. There's one in downtown Minneapolis. It's called Fogo de Chao. So for Christmas that year, I took him for lunch to Fogo de Chao. It's kind of a Christmas, one of his Christmas gifts. And before we went there, I said to him, I said, now, this is not a restaurant that you enter without a plan. I said, there's a salad bar. It's from Satan. He wants nothing more than you just to fill yourself up on pasta salad and all that other junk, green, leafy stuff. I said, resist temptation, son. You must resist temptation. I said, same thing goes for the bread rolls. You just, you stay focused on the meat, okay? Just stay with me here. And, and we did, for an hour and a half, we had the green card out, and it was top sirloin and ribeye steak and bacon wrapped filet mignon. And when we were done, my son pushed away from the table, and he said, wow. I had a similar reaction when I went to Waffle House for the first time. If you've never been to a Waffle House before, comedian Jim Gaffigan says, just picture a gas station bathroom that sells waffles. <laughs> and, and there's some truth to that, but I'm telling you, these waffles, wow, they are really good. The first time I had one, they brought it out and there was this tub. And it was a little, kind of a little-ish tub, and I thought, you know, I don't know if that's going to be enough syrup for me. And then I opened it, and it was the butter. <laughs> and I was like, wow, let's go. Like, this is it. Now, there are a few non-food-related items that make me go, wow. My youngest daughter is seven weeks old, and a couple weeks ago, she smiled at me for the first time, and that was a wow. When I see how good my wife is with babies, I just think, wow. Every time I come up over the hill towards the city of Duluth, and there's that moment where I see the lift bridge for the first time and Lake Superior, something in me just goes, wow. Wow. But sadly today, many of us are starting to lose our wow. For instance, when each of my kids were born, I was in tears. I mean, I was just blown away at the miracle of human life. But then two months later, after getting no sleep and receiving a whopping hospital bill, I cried again. <laughs> and I lost my wow a little bit. When we went out to South Dakota to Custer State Park, the first time we saw the buffalo, Everybody in our car went crazy. All the kids were like, whoa, look at that buffalo. That's amazing. 45 minutes later, we were ready to go. And the whole herd of buffalo was blocking the road. And I'm like, will someone get this stupid animal out of my way? And I had lost my wow. It's the curse of familiarity. That the first time you see something, the first time you experience something, you go, wow, that was unbelievable. But then over time, you're like, you know, I've done that. I've, I've seen that. I, I've experienced that. And you begin to lose your wow. I've noticed that this is true in our relationships with God as well. You've probably heard me talk about this before, but I didn't grow up going to church. I didn't go on Christmas. I didn't go on Easter. And honestly, I was okay with that. There were, at that time in my life, there were other things that were more important to me, were a higher value. But I can still remember where I was. As a freshman in college, when I knelt down by this dingy dorm room couch, 
And for the first time, I understood what God had done when he sent his son, Jesus Christ, for me. And I remember thinking, God, I can't believe that you would forgive me. I can't believe that you would love me. I can't believe that you would send your only son to die for me. Wow, God. But that was 20 years ago. And over time, the story, without even realizing, it starts to become pretty familiar. John 3.16 says this. It says, God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. I remember the first time I read that, I thought, unbelievable. I cannot believe that God would do that. But then I started seeing that verse on signs at sporting events, and I kind of just went back to my life of friends and school and stress. And without even realizing it, without even knowing it, I began to lose my wow. Today's message is titled, God Sent His Son. Because if it's true that there is a God who sent his one and only son to die for us, that ought to wow us. My wife volunteers in our student ministries at our Lionel Lakes campus, and a few months ago, one of the middle school girls in her group asked this question. She said, why did God have to send his son? Have you ever thought about that before? It's a really good question. I mean, why couldn't we just apologize? Why couldn't we just say, you know, God, I know I've, I've done some things I should not have done. I ignored you when I shouldn't have ignored you. I'm so sorry about that. Will you forgive me? And God could just go, you know, I, I do. I, I forgive you for that. Th thanks for apologizing. If all religions lead to heaven, if all religions lead to the same place, which is what a lot of people these days believe, they believe it doesn't matter if you follow Jesus, Buddha, or Muhammad. It doesn't matter if you just kind of follow our culture which is a mix between Christianity, New Age, and sort of just do whatever you want, it doesn't really matter because they all end up in the same place. They'll all get you to God. If that's true, then why did God have to send his son? Why couldn't we just treat other people as we would want to be treated and travel to a place like Mecca once in our lifetime and eat at Chick-fil-A once a week? Right? That would pretty much cover every religion, I would think. Why did God have to send his son? In fact, if all religions lead to heaven, if all religions lead you to the same place, then God sending his own son to die is quite cruel. I mean, think about this for a moment. Here's Jesus, and nails are being pounded into his wrists and into his feet. He's stretched out on the cross, can't breathe. His spine is exposed from the flesh that was ripped away as he was beaten and whipped. Every time he tries to push himself up on the cross to relieve the pressure on his lungs, his exposed spine is rubbing up against that splintered cross. If it would be possible for us to get to God, to get to heaven, just by being a good person, then why would God send his son and allow him to go through that? I mean, that, that's not the most loving sacrifice ever. That would be more like cosmic child abuse. And by the way, there are some secular scholars today who accuse God of that. They'll say, oh, it's just like, it's just like cosmic child abuse. Why would God allow that to happen to his son? Unless, unless it was the most loving thing he could have done. Years ago, when my youngest son Jasper was just seven months old, we took him in for a minor surgery at Children's Hospital. And I say minor, but anytime your son is going under anesthesia for a three-hour surgery, that doesn't feel minor to you as the father. And so before they took Jasper away, I asked if I could pray for him. And so I put my hand on his head, and I just prayed for protection and for comfort, and I prayed for wisdom for the doctors, and I just declared right then and there that no matter what happened in the next couple hours, God, we love you and we trust you. They walked us down this long hallway, and the whole while, Jasper was reaching out to me and smiling, and then we got to a T in the hallway, and the nurse said, well, those double doors over there will take you back out to the lobby, and so we went to the left, and they took Jasper off to the right. 
And as I went through those double doors, I looked back at my son's face peeking at me over the nurse's shoulder. And it was so sad. It was so hard to leave your son in a moment like that. It was so hard to know the pain that he was going to be experiencing. And that was just a minor surgery. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. I have two other sons besides Jasper. This was God's one and only son. And he gave him. For what? A a surgery? No, it was a death. It was a beating. It was a humiliation. My son was carried off in the loving arms of a nurse. God's son was carried off by a mob demanding his blood. He was beaten. He was whipped. And at the end of it all, Jesus cries out these words. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That Jesus would always experience this oneness with God the Father. He always experienced God's presence all of a sudden found himself alone. As God the Father, who could have nothing to do with evil, sin, or impurity, had to look the other way. Why would God do that? Why would God allow that? That's the question I want to try and answer today. Romans 8, 3 says this. It says, the law of Moses couldn't save us because of our sinful nature. Now, what is the law of Moses? The law of Moses was the ancient laws given to the nation of Israel that are found in the first five books of the Old Testament. And the most famous part of the law of Moses is the Ten Commandments. So thou shalt not steal, lie, murder, commit adultery, that kind of thing. But notice what he says here. He says the law of Moses couldn't save us because of our sinful nature. That you could try your very best to be such a good person and obey every law that God has given, and we're just born with a sinful nature that goes, eh, I don't want to do that. And eventually, you will sin. So Paul says that God had another plan. Says, but God put into effect a different plan to save us. Not the plan of, hey, you be a good person, you obey God at all times. Instead, he sent his own son in a human body like ours, except that ours are sinful. God destroys sin control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. Now, there's a lot in this verse, so let me try to break this down for you. But it says that God sent his son in a human body. God did not send Jesus Christ as a spirit. He's not like some Christmas spirit that's just floating around out there. He was in a human body, which means that Jesus got tired Jesus went to the bathroom. Jesus had body odor. He wasn't some glowing, angelic being. He was a human being. He wasn't flittering around on wings. He walked. He was a human being just like we are. But the main difference is that Jesus never sinned. Now, why does this matter to any of us? Why should we care about this? Well, the law of God condemns sin. Like any good parent, God says, hey, here's some things that are going to harm your life. And if you do those, there's going to be some consequences. But God is so perfect. He is so holy and just that here's the consequence for sin. It's death. God says, I cannot allow sinful people into heaven. I must maintain my own purity. God says, you know what? I have to punish sin or else I wouldn't be just. I wouldn't be good. I would be letting people hurt other people and do nothing about it. And if God is not just and God is not good, then God is not God. But that's a problem for us, isn't it? Because we all sin. We all deserve that punishment. And this is where some of us start to get a little bit uneasy. Because I've realized that we live in a culture that likes to think of ourselves as mistakers and not sinners. If I go up to someone and I say, hey, are you perfect? Every single person is going to go, no. I mean, I'm not perfect, right? You'll hear people say that. I mean, I'm not perfect. If I ask them, hey, have you made some mistakes? Every single person is going, oh, my goodness. I could tell you of all the mistakes I've made. I mean, I have made a lot of mistakes. But then when I ask them, are you a sinner? Now they start to squirm a little. I mean, I'm not perfect. I mean, I've certainly made some mistakes. But I don't know if I'm a sinner, 
we like to think of ourselves as mistakers and not sinners. I've done this before, and you don't need to raise any hands, but how many of us here have ever told a lie before? You know, it's just a little lie. I, I've done that numerous times. And what do you call someone who tells a lie? What do you call them? A liar. How many of us here have ever stolen something before? Even just like a piece of gum or a CD or something. I used to do that in high school, steal CDs. What do you call someone who steals things? Well, you call them a thief. Then the rest of the Ten Commandments, two of them say don't murder, don't commit adultery. To which at least some of us go, okay, good, I haven't done those. But then Jesus comes along and he says, well, if you're angry with someone in your heart, it's like you've committed murder. And if you look lustfully at someone, it's like you've committed adultery in your heart. In other words, I'm a lying, murdering, lustful thief. Some people are like, you're a pastor. Oh, you know, don't, don't sin around the pastor. Part of me wants to go, I'm a lying, murdering, lustful thief. Okay? I, I'm guilty. You're guilty. And because of our sinful nature, we cannot save ourselves. But thankfully, God had another plan. God put into effect a different plan to save us. He sent his own son in a human body like ours. Maybe today you feel far from God. Maybe today it feels to you like God has just said, you know what, I am done with you. You keep promising me that you're going to stop sinning, and then you don't do it, and I've just, I've just had it. That's how you think God is with you. Or you think I've ignored God for too long. My sins are too great. You need to know today that God sent his son. He's not sitting around waiting for you to take the initiative. He took the initiative by sending his son to this earth in a human body, and there's at least two reasons why God did that. The first one is this. God sent his son to rescue us from sin. So again, Romans 8, 3. God destroyed sin's control over us. How? By giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. God has a conundrum. He must punish sin, but he loves people and wants to spend eternity with them. How is he going to reconcile those two things? The answer is Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.21 it says that God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. When I was in elementary school, my parents took me down to Florida for the twins' spring training. And one day we went over to Tinker Field to watch the twins practice. And we were practically the only people who were there when all of a sudden my childhood hero, Kirby Puckett, came out to take batting practice. And when Puckett was done, he walked over to about a half a dozen of us who were standing there watching to sign autographs. And I was crushed. I didn't have any of my Kirby Puckett baseball cards. I didn't even have a ball for him to sign. All of a sudden, I looked over and down the aisle, underneath a seat, was this worn out, frayed, dirty, old baseball. And so I went running over and I grabbed it and I brought it back to Puckett for him to sign. And when he was done signing it, he went on to the guy next to me who was a sports memorabilia dealer. And so this guy had like 50 baseball cards, balls, all kinds of sports memorabilia for Puckett to sign. And when he was finally done signing all of that, Puckett stopped and looked right at me. And he said, do you have everything you need, kid? And I'm standing there holding my dirty, old, worn out, filthy baseball. And I said, yeah, I'm good. And Puckett reached down and he grabbed the bat that he had been using in batting practice. And he reached up and he handed it to me. Here's a picture that my dad caught right after this. This is me with the cool hair. <laughs> and there's the bat and there's Puckett. And right after he did this, the sports memorabilia dealer goes, I'll give you $1,000 for that bat. And stupidly, I said no. <laughs> if he asked me that today, I'd be like, you bet. You're just sitting in my basement. You can have it for $1,000 if you want to. I'll invest the money. But instead, at the time, I'm like, no, no. And I kept the bat. But here's what I wonder today. I wonder how many of us feel like that dirt, dirty, old, rotten, filthy baseball. Torn, tattered, 
banged up. The shine has worn off of life because of some hard things that you have gone through. You need to know today that God sent his son And here's what he wants to do. God wants to take your filthy, dirty sin, the things that you don't want anybody else to know about or to find out about, he wants to take those. And in exchange, he wants to give you eternal life. It's the greatest trade that you could ever make. Author and speaker Charles Spurgeon once said it this way. He says, you stand before God as if you were Christ." Because Christ stood before God as if he were you. Here's what that means. It means that one day you're going to stand before God to give an account of your life. And if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, God will look at you. And he will look at you and see you as he sees Jesus Christ. Perfect in every way. And the reason that God will see you that way is because on the cross, Jesus took all of our sin, our shame, and our guilt. It's the greatest trade ever. We should have been condemned, but Jesus stood in our place. We should have received punishment, but Jesus was our substitute. We should have received God's anger, but instead we receive his mercy. We should have had to endure God's wrath, but instead we are lavished with his love. Does that wow you? It wows me. Not every day, of course, but when I stop and I think about where my life was headed before I realized and believed that God had sent his son, I say, wow, God. In 2010, 33 miners were trapped in a cave in Chile. And you probably heard about this story when it happened. They were 2,000 feet underground. They were over three miles from the entrance of the mine shaft when it collapsed upon them. And these 33 miners were trapped for 69 days. Recently, there was a movie made about this story, and I want you to see the trailer. Take a look. In Psalm 40, David writes these words. He said, I waited patiently for the Lord. For 69 days, those 33 miners had to wait patiently. And there must have been moments where they said, you know what, it's not going to happen. We're never going to get rescued. And you may wonder that today yourself. You may be waiting patiently on something and just wondering, God, is this ever going to happen? David says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and he heard my cry. There was a moment when all of a sudden they said, we hear those miners down there. We, we hear their cry. And there is a moment where God hears your cry as well. Through all of the rubble and through all of the pain. Maybe today you feel like your life is just filled with rubble, the rubble of a divorce. Or a breakup. Or a medical condition, or a family member who's struggling. David says, I had to wait patiently for the Lord, but he turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the cave, out of the mine shaft, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on a rock and he gave me a firm place to stand. God drilled a hole through the layers of this universe in the person of Jesus Christ, to rescue us from our sin. And today, Jesus is reaching out a hand to you, and he's going, grab on to me, because I can get you out of this rubble. I can get you out of this pit, and I can put you on firm ground. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to rescue us from our sin. He also sent his son to reconcile us to God. Romans 5.10 says these words. It says, For since we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, we will certainly be delivered from eternal punishment by his life. See, like any good parent, God says, hey, here's going to be some consequences for your sin. There's going to be a punishment there. But Jesus comes along and he takes that punishment for us. And it's never too late. It's never too late to close the gap between your sinfulness and the righteousness of God. Several years ago, my wife and I went to Macaroni Grill over in Rosedale Mall. It's it's since closed down. But when we were there, the manager brought an envelope to our table. And he set it down. He said, in this envelope, there's a prize. 
There's a prize in every envelope. He said, some of them have a free trip to Italy. Some of them have $10,000 cash. Some of them have a free appetizer. I thought, which one am I going to get? Trip to Italy or free appetizer? But he said, every single envelope was a winner. And if I just came back to Macaroni Grill another time, the manager would break the seal and I would get what was in that envelope. In other words, whoever believes in Macaroni Grill and trusts in them will receive cash off and rewards. It was an offer of biblical proportion. So a few weeks later, we were going to go back to the Macaroni Grill. But before we left, I looked at this envelope again. And in real small print in the bottom left-hand corner, I realized that there was an expiration date. And we had missed it by two days. I opened the envelope and found out we would have gotten 50% off of our meal. In other words, the macaroni grill, they have a whoever policy. Whoever comes back will get a prize, but they didn't have a whenever clause. There was an expiration date. Have you ever wondered if there's an expiration date with God? Have you ever thought to yourself, you know what, I've, I've done too much. I've sinned too long. I've ignored God. For all of these years, I've made too many empty promises, and now I think my expiration date has come. You need to know today that not only does God have a whoever clause, but he has a whenever policy. Author Max Lucado says this. He says, if heaven's banquet has nameplates, there's one bearing your name. We lose so much in life, sobriety, jobs, and love. We lose our youth, energy, and dreams but we never lose our place on God's whoever list. No hour is too late. No status is too small. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son for whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. A week ago from this past Wednesday, I received a text message that said Carson passed away last night, so heartbroken. The text was from Don Grafham, who's the head of our campus ministries, and Carson was Carson Frutiger. We had hired Carson last summer as a student ministry pastor at our Anoka campus. And his first week on the job, he went on a high school missions trip with us on our big city missions trip. And while he was there, he felt fatigued and tired. And so when he came home, he went to the doctor and they ran a series of tests. And they finally discovered that he had a rare fungal disease that he had most likely contracted while he was in the Boundary Waters. And so for several months, he was at the Mayo Clinic. He was on life support and they didn't think he was going to live. But then on December 17th, he received a transplant surgery. And he got a new heart. And he got new lungs. And he got two new kidneys. And there was some hope. But then on January 19th, his Caring Bridge site said that Carson is very sick. Complications from his surgery, unstable condition. And on January 23rd, Carson Frutiger died. He was 26 years old. In October, when Carson was still able to communicate and talk, he had looked at his parents at one point and he said, I am ready to go be with Jesus. And we believe that today he is. But I want to read to you the last Caring Bridge post that his mom and dad wrote. And as I read this, I want you to picture yourself as a parent writing these words about your son after he had died or passed away. They wrote this. They said, Carson is no longer with us, but he is definitely home. God is good all the time. And that was it. You might have expected them to write, it's not fair. It's not right. He was so young, why God? But instead they wrote, Carson is no longer with us. 
but he is definitely home. God is good all the time. Only a mom and a dad who know that God lost his son one time as well could have written words like that. And as Jesus was hanging on the cross, people could have said, why God? It's not fair. It's, it's not right. He's so young. Why God? But God sent his son to die so that people like Carson Frutiger could live. Carson is definitely home. God sent his son. You know, our lives are so unpredictable. One moment you're portaging and canoeing through the boundary waters and the next moment you're lying in a hospital bed. And I want to ask you today, very honestly and soberly, if something were to happen to you in the next couple weeks or months or years, would other people be able to say about you, he is definitely home? She is definitely home? That only happens through faith in Jesus Christ. He's the only one who was a human being, so he was uniquely qualified to pay the penalty that human beings deserve. He was a human being, but he never sinned. So he didn't deserve to die. But he didn't die for himself. He died for us so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Have you believed in Jesus Christ and put your faith and your trust in him? I want to give all of us today an opportunity to pray a prayer, to just talk to God and to say, God, I believe that you sent your son to die for me. And when I'm done with this prayer, I know there's a tendency just to kind of want to run out and beat the traffic, but I'm just going to ask you, just hold for one moment because we believe this is a sacred moment. If you're already a believer in Christ, would you spend time right now just praying that other people would come to faith in Christ? And then I just have two things I want to give you at the end. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for sending your son, your one and only son. And you gave him, God, so that whoever believes in him would not perish, would not face eternal punishment, but would have eternal life. God, there might be people here today who have run from you, ignored you or put you off to the side. There might be some of us here who, for whatever reason, have never put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ. And God, right now, in the quietness of their own mind, they're just going to pray these words. God, I believe that you sent your son in a human body to die on a cross to pay for my sins. God, I believe that Jesus never sinned, but he died, he, he paid the penalty so that I, God, would never have to die, that I would never have to perish and I could have eternal life. God, would you give me that hope and that assurance right now? as I recognize, as I confess my sin and put my trust in Christ. And God, for all of us, maybe there's rubble in our life and we're patiently waiting on you. We're calling out to you, God. God, I pray right now that you would rescue us, that you would hear our cry, that you would drill down through all that rubble and grab us, God, and put us on firm ground. We pray that, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer, would you stop off at the Next Steps area at your campus? Or if you have to get going, text the word BELIEVE to 555-888. We have a 12-week study guide we want to give you for free that will just help you get started. And then here's the second thing. Sign up to be baptized. As you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, take that next step. Be baptized next weekend. Have a great week, everybody. Thanks.